Hi, my name is Cooper. And I'm Daniel Coombs. And February's What's Neat starts right, right now. now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for February 2020. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we do have a great show lined up for you with five segments, starting with a great layout tour that we go to in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We look at the North American Prototype Modelers Club. What a magnificent very large layout this is. We've got a great interview with a lot of footage to show you the beautiful layout. Also, we've got some great drone footage. We haven't had that in a long time from Stephen M. Conroy. He shares with us a few beautiful clips that he shot. The one on the bridge is absolutely magnificent this month on What's Neat. Campbell Rice, he shares with us a different technique for taking ground up leaves and adding to our scenery underneath the trees. He didn't do it like I did it many years back. He actually used a small blender that did not require water. So it's a pretty good trick that he teaches us on this month's show. The last thing we do is we take a look at Chris and Don McReynolds. Beautiful Santa Fe layout here in St. Louis. This will be on tour in July at the NMRA 2020 show in St. Louis when that happens. And it's an absolutely great way to end the video. Now to start out this month's video, I wanna talk about this moon that's over my shoulder. On past videos, you've seen James Ruggier and myself do photograph shoots outdoors using the real moon. And it's always moving and we're always chasing it. But this time we wanted to do a winterscape shot for Athern Trains featuring one of their brand new cabooses that they're coming out with. And I used this moon that I painted many years ago for the shot, and it came out really good in that it just sits on the wall and the moon doesn't move. But the fact was, the subject of the photo was this gorgeous caboose that Athens is coming out with, which will be tricked out with lights and all sorts of sound effects in this model. I also have a Santa Fe SD40. 5-2 in the background with its lights lit and the beacons lit. We also have this beautiful station that James Regeer had built. This is a Hutchinson, Kansas station. I believe this is a Wathers kit, but James had put many LEDs into the kit. And the important factor on this shot was to get all the lights on all the models to come out. As you see the moon, I've got a lamp on the floor, a simple house lamp with an old light bulb in it, and that simply lit up the moon in the background for the shot for a about 30 seconds. We also lit the lights on the locomotive for about the same amount of time, about 30 seconds on that. And then we also then lit up all the LED lights in the, strain, in the train station for another 30 seconds. So that's three different exposures at 30 seconds a piece to bring through the lights. I then took a flashlight and I waved the flashlight in front of the models in order to light up the outside of the caboose. And the last thing that we did was we then lit all the lights on the caboose, the rear light mainly, and left that shutter exposure open for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes was the right, right correct amount of time in order to pull off a good even exposure where everything was lit just right. Now the shutter on the camera was set for an aperture of 22. That's the smallest aperture that I can make on my Nikon D2X that I use, that I've been using for years. And the ASA was set for 100. That's so that there's no grain in the shot. It's a completely crystal clear shot. And now I can show you, this is how the final photograph did come out. It, it was a very well lit shot, individual lighting on all the pieces as I've explained. It's fun to experiment with shots like this, especially when you're doing them inside and it's not cold outside as it is currently. You don't have to chase the moon. The moon stays right where I want it to all the time. And then after Chris Palomares at Athens Trains got a hold of the picture, he added a little bit of fog and really juiced up the picture with just a little touch of Photoshop just to give it an accentuated what you see here. So it's really fun to experiment with different types of photography using our models. Just nighttime, daytime, there's no such a thing as a wrong time. Just experiment with timing and different exposures. So with that, let's continue on with the rest of this month, February 2020, What's Neat?
for this segment of What Sneaked, I'm with Al Houts, and I'm standing in this most magnificent layout that I have ever seen. And I've been here eight years ago, shooting high eight tape, but tonight, we've got a full open house going on in beautiful Milwaukee. Al, tell me about this layout. What is the name of this club? This is the North American Prototype Modelers Club, or NAPM for short, just yeah. our initials, NAPM. Uh -huh. It started in the late 70s when a group of about 10 to 15 local guys said, hey, let's make the best model railroad club in Milwaukee. Well, I think they overshot a little because I think they've got probably the best club in the United States. It's but, certainly you know, the biggest and the most beautiful. Yeah. How many years did it take you guys to build this? Well, we're in our 41st or second right now. Um, I was president here for 11 years and board of directors for longer than that. And I kind of stepped down, you know, new blood into management is always a good thing. Uh, but when I moved here in 2001, I, I knew people at Walther's and, you know, I had belonged to a club in Birmingham, Alabama, and I said, where should I join? And they said, oh, there's only one place. You know, go, go to see the folks at North American. And so I came down here and I got the same tour that you're going to get or that have had. And I looked at this and said, well, this is it. And I told my wife, you can have the basement back, sweetheart, because why? You know, oh there's, no, there's no point in building a layout at home when I've got all this to play with. So, you know. The that is so true. And the one thing you, you did say was it's a business. You guys actually have your own location for 40 years. That's called security. You don't put this much effort into a layout unless you know you've got a substantial base, which you do have. Tell us about the organization. Well. The organ okay, we're a 501c3, so you can donate here and it's actually tax free. Uh, we're very well funded. The dues are 35 or $30 a month for a standard membership, and we drop that down 25% once you get over 65. So we're very well funded. Usually, club organizations they run into trouble because of money, okay? And they, it was very it decided very early on this is going to be the number one rule if you want to play, you got to pay. So, so you guys own your own location? We, well, we don't own here. We pay rent here every month, and we're underneath what's left of Southgate Shopping Center in Milwaukee, which was the first big shopping center in this area. And it's kind of funny because what's here is just a small percentage of the original complex, and we were offered space at the other end, and we had a choice between two places to look at. And had we picked the other one, none of this would exist because it's all gone. It's a Walmart now. Wow. So it was a flip of the coin. Anybody tells you flipping the coin, it's that's important. <laughs> now this is so amazing. How would you describe the part of the country that you model on this layout? Well, the object was to make any modeler that wanted to come here comfortable. Okay, so we call it generic Midwest. It's got a little bit of other things thrown into it. You'll notice this is Southern California or you know mid mid level California uh, with the dry grass, and we've got the mountains up here and the snowshed and so forth. But the vast bulk of it is generic Midwest. Uh, anybody can run anything here. We have a, an era that runs from shortly after the end of World War II up until about 1980s. So if you own equipment that fits in that time frame, you can leave it on the layout. If you have other stuff you're still more than welcome to run but we expect you to take it off and put it away when you're done so that we have some continuity in the appearance you know you guys like the long run trains long trains don't you yeah if i ever moved out of here i'd probably have to sell three quarters of what i own because it's all prototype consist passenger trains and you know a, a prototype consist passenger train even an ho scale can be 18 19 feet long that's awesome as we walk and see the back side of the layout i see a long river and a lot of bridges so you guys like expansive scenery yeah, that's important. Uh, there's always an, a problem with modelers a lot of modelers have is, I've got space here, so I've got to put something in it. No, you don't. You need open spaces and some expanses between the clusters of activity because it gives the illusion of distance. Right. And as I walk up these other aisles, I see train sheds and mountains. Yeah. Oh, this, this was about a 12-person uh, project that ran for almost a year. Uh, Timberline scenery. I think that guy retired off of our tree purchases because he's not in business anymore. But we, yeah, we're very focused. Uh, we run everything here by committee. A scenery committee chair, we have a track committee chair. So projects don't get done willy-nilly. You go to the chairman and say, I have an idea, I'd like to do this. And he might say, that's a great idea, let's do that. Or he may say, no, I don't like that idea, but I need people over here doing this. So the. We have a president, we have the board of directors, and we have the committee chairs that direct the activity in the club. 
Now, Al, tell me about this amazing train station and train shed. It is just beautiful. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Uh, the train station itself is made out of Lego blocks. And it's kind of a funny story because there's a lot of white ones in there, but there's also a lot of every other color. When we went to the Lego people and wanted to buy white ones, they wouldn't sell us white ones. They wouldn't break up the sets. So we painted a lot of blue ones and red ones and yellow ones to get it white. Uh, the windows are, that's architectural soap and chart tape, very old techniques, but it still holds together. And the train shed itself is entirely scratch built. All of those trusses over there, those individual truss panels, it's all wood. And we had a couple of guys taking home materials and coming back with a box of trusses. Right. And, you know, putting them in and in several years to do that. That was before my time. It was mostly done when I joined, which was in 2001. So the vast, the vast majority of that was finished. There's been a lot of debates of do we cover it, and it always comes up no, because then you can't see any of the trains, but you also can't see all of that lovely work. That's and awesome. It, and it's lit as well. Now, as I look up the sides of the layout, I see a lot of buildings and a lot of switch yards and a lot of switchings, and your signals work. Yes. Um, I'm probably going to have to get an electronics guy for you, but that's all, <laughs> that's all tied into the DCC system. Okay, we have sensors for that. Uh, NCE, when NCE. they do something, when, when they do something new, they come see us because this is, we're actually past the number of command station or, or of booster stations and whatnot. We have a few special things we do here to accommodate the size of the system necessary to run everything. And all of the tracks are broken up and isolated into three foot sections. So if we get an issue, we can go around and pull jumpers until we find the problem. Right. We don't have to cut or paste or do anything else. It's all very easily trouble shot. Uh, and I, if we, well, I can show you some little things and we can take hot shots of the control panels and how we do that because we've got some guys who work in the aircraft industry that wired up our switching panels. Right. And they're a sight to behold. So give me an idea, what are the dimensions of this layout? Uh, it's roughly 4,000 square feet and about 27, 28 scale miles of mainline run when you do an operating session. Because we come in, I mean, you see two staging yards against these walls, so you start from either east or west from the staging yard, come onto the layout, run around the double track main, run around the single track, and then off. Right. Okay. And that's your 28 scale miles of run. Right. Uh, tonight it's in display mode and the main line and the branch line are separated because you'll notice you have freight trains on one and passenger trains on the other uh, so that we can give a lot for the fans to see. Uh, but normally in ops mode, we run off the staging yard, around the layout twice, and then off the other side, east to west. Wow, I see long sweeping co uh, curves, and it looks like you're about 51 inches off the floor. About that, yeah, and the minimum radius here is 48 inches, so there's no restrictions on any kind of equipment. I can run my 1941 daylight with the full-width diaphragms touching which is it's really nice for the appearance of the trains. Right, and you said you're using NCE and a lot of throttles. Tell me about how many cabs can run this layout. Uh, there are about 20 right now. And we have a few channels reserved for club use that we're not using. I think 10 of them, but we have about 20 active cabs. And that's for the radio. And then every so many feet, you'll see the plug-ins here, uh, just in case the radio should ever right take vacation or whatever radios do. It's, electronics are never perfect 100% of the time. Uh, so you can plug in and, and follow your train, you know, and then we put the radio in later. Uh, so you can have, uh, you could probably have 12 to 15 trains on this layout at the same time. The guys have to be cognizant of what's going on. They've got to watch the signals. They've got to, you know, be aware of the traffic, but there's room to run a lot of stuff here. Another thing I've noticed is you paid very close attention on how to light all the scenery on this layout. Uh, all of these lights here are 5,000 Kelvin lamps, so they're color corrected. So when you take pictures here, you won't get that greenish tinge that you get from standard fluorescent lightings. And we also have some incandescents that are strategically placed based on scenes we want to highlight. Al, this is the most amazing layout I've ever seen, and I've seen it about eight years ago, and I'm still absolutely overwhelmed every time I come here. I want to thank you so much for sharing this layout with the viewers of What's Neat. Anything else you want to add? Uh, just come see us next year. You know, so you guys are open and people can join your group. Yeah, we are open and we, you know, we we are we function based on attraction rather than recruitment. Uh, you have to come see us and ask and be interesting. Not us. It makes a better fit all the way around. That way we tend to keep the members we get. You know, and when you're, it's like trying to hire a good handyman. They don't need to advertise. They've got all the work they can do, and we're kind of the same way with members. 
Tell me this is the best hobby in the world, Al. Oh, it is. I wouldn't have it any other way. That's awesome. And with that, guys, that's this segment for what's neat in model railroading this week. Rock and roll. Thank you, Al. Hello, this is Michael Gross, and you're watching What's Neat with Ken Patterson. So it's that time of the year. All the leaves have fallen off the trees. Everything's bare. 
So, that's a great time to get together and work on your model train and do one important thing. I like to collect leaves, dried dead leaves that have fallen off the trees recently and use them on my model railroad. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So here's a, I have a bag of leaves here that I've collected from my backyard and I pulled out a couple, couple different ones. When I'm looking to collect leaves, <clears throat> I don't typically want to do uh, this type of, of leaf, which is, I guess, an oak. Uh, the main thing is because they have the stem and this doesn't blend very well, so you can use these for logs or whatever. So if I do collect one of these, I'll, I'll usually just break it off and, and discard it so that basically I have the leaf. But what I'm trying to look for is basically just leaves like this. Something that doesn't have the have a, too long of a stem on it. And uh, kind of collect those and you know make sure they're good and dry, they're not wet. So then what I do is I have my magic bullet here. And so I'll take my unit apart and what I'll do is I'll take these leaves and I'll just shove them down in here. Just collect and just pack it full. And any blender will work. I just happen to have a magic bullet and guys uh, I'll give you a heads up don't take the one out of your wife's kitchen because it, it will stain it. And uh, I do this for dirt too when I, I want to add some dirt to the layout. So basically that's what I got. Just very simple. It's just packed in there. And then uh, so helps to put it on right. Put that back on. And then simply I'm going to drop it in and run it for a little while. Shake it so that I get the uncut particles to the bottom. tell by the sound of it when it gets when they get pretty much ready uh, that's that's pretty close we'll just we'll run with that so then I'll take a strainer basically I'm gonna dump these out and the fine stuff will go through and the bigger stuff will stay up top and you can do this two or three times till you till it gets good and processed. So this is what I end up with. It's a very fine leafy material and pretty much it's ready to go on the layout. Now what I'll do is I, I have this finer, this rougher stuff here. Um, sometimes you can use it for in, in heavy um, briary type um, patches and um, but typically what I'll do is I'll just run it back through the through the blender with some other and and chop it up a little bit finer but yeah so that's pretty much what you end up with is this right here now here I'm on the layout you can see where I have placed the tree and basically you know grass doesn't grow under trees very well so I don't put the grass around there I take the take the leaves and just just kind of basically take them and just kind of sprinkle them around everywhere and that kind of gives a, a little bit more realistic look of uh, where dead leaves had fallen off and kind of adds to the scenery another another tree that I have done done that too right through there so get out there now and collect you some leaves even if you don't grind them up at the moment stick them under the layout stick them in a closet somewhere that you can use them in the future because this is a good, cheap, free way to add a lot of realism to your layout. 
And that's what's neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I'm with Chris and Don McReynolds over here in this beautiful Santa Fe circuit 1970 to 1972 layout. And I've got to tell you what, this is exactly what we all expect when you bring up the word passion for trains. So tell me about this fantastic layout that you have built with your son. Well, this one is actually the second one we built. We moved and uh, we started probably about 10 years ago. and. Uh, wanted a double track main line and and so that's what we got and got a lot of Santa Fe equipment. You love the cigar paint schemes, I can tell that, but you also have a passion for the industry which is really represented on your layout because you've got years of experience over here on the east side of St. Louis in a certain industry. Tell us about that. Well, Chris and I both work at the refinery. Uh, I started out with Shell for 20 years and retired from Phillips 66, which it is now, and uh, he's a crane operator at the refinery. My mother also worked there for 44 years. I had 37, so. That's awesome, and Chris, your mother has a passion for puzzles, because I've noticed all the art down here in this layout room that decorates this layout is all a lot of Santa Fe puzzles. Tell me about that. Well ever since I, as long as I can remember she's put puzzles together so we, I guess we was able to find that Santa Fe had uh, several puzzles to offer so uh, it's good that she could put them together and glue them together and we could hang them on the walls down here. That's great art. The one thing that's great about this hobby is when you have a father-son relationship where they're both working on the models together and Chris I understand you really like scenery tell us about that. I do, I do. I like seeing the uh, kind of how it all comes together uh, from the grass to the trees and kind of you envision something in your head of how it's going to look when it's done and it's neat to kind of see it all come to life. Do you have a favorite part of this layout? Uh, I definitely have to say in the, in the city, seeing that all come together with the people and the rivers, the bridges that cross the rivers definitely. So, so. Neat stuff. One thing I've noticed on this layout is you've used a lot of Wather structures and kits, including bridges. Most all the kits are probably uh, Walters kits. Uh, I like the I like bridges, as you can tell. Uh, the double track here with the swing bridge reminds me of the one that used to be in Alton that the Burlington run across. So, yeah, and then the uh, the trestle over there was. Uh, uh, Illinois Terminal will run across a trestle like that up uh, north of Staunton, Illinois. That's awesome. And I see a lot of your friends in the background that love to run the layout with us. Is that pretty much? Yeah, uh, got to have special thanks. The guy holding the camera here is, is uh, Sonny Sellers. He, he helps me all the time. In fact, we spent nights down here until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, Ken Crosswitch down here that owns K10 model trains. Uh, helped me tremendously and of course all my other friends back there. That's the one beautiful thing about the hobby is the magnitude of individuals that you meet, the personalities and the people that complement your passion. Yeah that's right I mean it makes it a lot more fun. Uh, can't say I really enjoy coming down here too much by myself so the more people the better. That's awesome. What else would you like to add to this Chris? Oh, just. Kind of like he said, it's fun to be nice to, rather than just him and I, it's nice when you get a crowd down here and get multiple trains running and uh, maybe get to the point where we can start actually do some operating sessions. And, uh, Ooh, we're, paperwork. Yeah, where we're leaving, yes. dropping off cars, picking up cars, so it'd be nice to see that all come together in the future. Now, if you all out there would like to see this beautiful layout, it will be on tour for the St. Louis 2020 NMRA show coming up this July, and you're going to have probably a bunch of busloads of people come and enjoy this work of art. Well, I hope we do. Uh, my last layout was on was on the NMRA tour, and we really enjoyed it. In fact, Chuck Hitchcock and uh, several of them came to see it, and of course they're Santa Fe fans too. And yes. so that was great. 
the bench work height is just right. Your minimum radius, you've got some wide radiuses on this, a lot of double track and single track main line, which will be great for the operating. Tell me how high is about the layout? I think it's about 54 inches. Uh, the I tried to stay with a minimum radius of about 30. Okay. So that way everything, I can run almost everything, the uh, passenger trains and the longer cars. Something else I've noticed that you really enjoy now is signaling. You guys are getting into the lighting effects of signaling. Well, the signals are there and they're lit. They don't actually work, but they do add a lot to the layout and then someday they may work prototypically. I hope. Oh God. Guys, gentlemen, this is the best hobby in the world, and it's because of relationships, father and son, just like this, that make it magic. So thank you very much. That's this segment for What's Neat. Be sure to check out this layout if you're coming to St. Louis for the 2020 NMRA show. And guys, let's give a round of applause for Don and Chris, right? Okay, thank you. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com.